I am Brian Lee Durfee, author of The Forgetting Moon, The Blackest Heart, and The Lonesome Crown, all published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. Today I will be reviewing The Only Good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones, also published by Simon & Schuster's Saga Press. You know, once in a while I will review a novel that's put out by my same publisher, that's been edited by my same editor, that's had the graphic design and covers designed by the same people that did mine, you know. And I think Saga Press does stellar, stellar. I think they're one of the top publishing companies that do uh, covers. I mean, I think they did a great job on my book. Here's my book too, Blackest Heart. Again, another great job. Let's take a look at Stephen Graham Jones's cover. I mean, this thing is magnificent. This thing stands out. This is a great, simple image of a nighttime scene with an elk and the, and the antlers. The eye, very gripping, very, I mean, it just stands out. It's just a great image. And then the, the typeface is just very simple. Everything's just so elegantly done. But then, and this is the way Saga Press does it. I mean, this is the way Saga Press do. They're awesome. So... Stellar, stellar job on the cover, folks. Stellar job on a cover. I always love the way they do their covers. Now, I I listened to this on audible.com as I read along in the book. I do that quite often. I will listen to the audible.com version and read along. The audible.com version was narrated by a person named Sean Taylor Corbett. Did a very good job. Did a very good job with the um, different character voices. I thought it was great. I enjoyed the performance Another stellar job there, too, folks. Let's talk about the book itself. What is this thing about? The Only Good Indians. What is this about? Man, it's a horror novel. That's why I decided to do this video in front of my Stephen King collection, because this reminded me, I mean, this is this reminded me of just really early on Stephen King stuff, where, um, you know, some of his earlier novels, where it was just, you could just tell Stephen King was having a blast writing the story. You can tell Stephen Graham Jones is having a blast writing this story just because it is from the get-go it is unique most of all unpredictable i mean i gotta say that right off the bat you will have no idea where this story is going no idea you think you might i mean you have you'll have no i mean even from the start you're gonna be like oh, i didn't expect that start and then halfway through you're like i didn't expect that and then i mean it's just non-stop twists and turns and things just going sideways in ways you don't expect which is great for a horror novel because this is above above all this is a horror novel but it's also just a great allegory of um friendship politics native american relations um it's got a lot of stuff going on in it. Let's get into it. What is this thing about? Well, it's about four guys, four Native Americans, who, when they were younger, their names are Lewis, Ricky, Cass, and Gabriel. When they were younger, and they were, you know, just young guys, they were out, just out and about, doing nothing, just be, being kind of lazy guys out in their pickup. They all have their rifles. I mean, this is happening in the oh, this is happening in the Western United States, where most people have guns and rifles, and they they have them in the back of their pickup truck. They've just got them. It's just a normal thing. And they're hunters. They and and they're wild game hunters. And uh, but they respect they respect nature. However, they make a mistake. They they're out in their pickup truck, and a wild herd of elk run through and they're like oh my gosh th- th- we've never been this close let's just start i mean and and the uh the animal part of themselves comes out and they take their rifles and they shoot the entire herd and they're thinking to themselves well this was completely illegal <laughs> we shouldn't have done this however we can be heroes if we use the meat of if we use all the meat and, and, and feed the reservation with all the meat. We can we can actually make this into a good thing, and so that's what they try to do. Um, but then one of the characters, Lewis, whose name is Lewis, one of the one of our Native American characters named Lewis A. Clark. I think that might be a metaphor for something. I'm not sure. Imagine the author had to have some sort of meaning behind that. Lewis A. Clark, Lewis Merriweather Clark. I, I mean, anyway, because his nickname is Merriweather. I, I, Lewis, uh, Lewis uh, goes to um, 
harvests the meat off one of the elk and he sees that the elk is still alive and it's a female elk and and he kills it he, he doesn't want to just it's one thing to shoot a herd of elk as they're running by it's kind of but then but when when you have to just stand over an elk and shoot it that's a different thing because now you know you're actually ending a life and you can see the per you can see the elk looking up at you and it's haunting for him because he does shoot her he shoots the elk and then when he's cleaning the guts out of her he sees that she was pregnant which makes it even worse for him and it's a it's something that haunts him his rest of his life and one of our other and so this is what the book is about is these four guys dealing with this situation because the game warden actually kind of catches them in the act of de-gutting all of these elk and he's like oh no 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 you know, so they all get in a, a heap, they get in a grip of trouble. Anyway, 10 years later, flash forward 10 years later, where these four guys are still dealing with this incident. And they're haunted by it, especially Lewis. One of the, one of the four Indians, Ricky, he dies in the prologue. No spoilers here. He, he, he dies in the prologue. Um, the prologue is kind of a flash forward, uh, and Ricky is beaten up and killed by a bunch of rednecks at a honky tonk bar. And he's a Native American, and this, that, and the other happens. But anyway, before he dies, he sees these, the eyes of all these elk that he's killed. And so we know, we know from the prologue, and the flashback scene that is the prologue that uh, the elk are going to be haunting this story. That the elk are sort of the ghosts of the story. Or so we think. Lewis, he goes on 10 years later, he marries a white woman, which is another thing that I liked about this uh, novel is there's a lot of Native American, Caucasian American interrelations going on through these books. And Stephen Graham Jones does not treat it politically correct. I mean, he, he cuts to the chase. He, he lets people, he lets you know what tensions there are when a Native American man marries a white woman and the way that the rest of the reservation sort of looks at that. And it's not nice, it's not friendly. And he doesn't shy away from that. He doesn't treat it as this politically correct thing that you have to dance around. He really cuts to the chase, really gets to it, really adds a lot of tension to the story. And so Lewis, Lewis A. Clark, he's married to the white woman. And he's starting to have visions of this elk that he killed. I mean, he saved... He actually saved the the hide of the elk, and he's kept it rolled up, and in, in the freezer. And, and he's and, and now he's just starting to have these wacky visions. He's starting to go a little mentally ill, and he's got this other friend that's a Native American woman that he's really close friends with. That he he, he loans fan. They're they're both fantasy books fans, and he loans fantasy books to this coworker of his who's a full-blooded Native American. And so his wife is his Caucasian wife is really jealous that he's like so close to this actual Native American woman and they share books and share and and but Lewis just is haunted by this elk and I don't want to get into but he's so going so mentally ill over this thing that he starts to draw like you know those you know when there's a murder scene and there's a chalk outline he starts to do this chalk outline in the middle of his living room of the dead elk because he can remember how it was laying when he killed it and he does this chalk outline but he does it in masking tape he uses masking tape and then this this native american friend that he's co-worker friend that he's got that's female starts to help him with it and he's really freaked out by this and i don't want to get too much more into the plot than that because we start to give spoilers but he starts to think he starts to have this he's mentally ill and he starts to think he's seeing visions and he's starting to think that his Caucasian wife is the elf, is the elk come back to life. Or no, maybe it's my, my Native American friend here who's helping me do this chalk outline. Maybe she's the, maybe she is the elk come back to life. So he starts to see demons in both women. That's as far as I'm going to go into the plot because that's where everything just goes bonkers. Oh my gosh. Class. There are some classic Stephen King-esque horror moments, grotesque, gross-out moments. Pretty early on in this book, and they continue on, as we also get to know, because I just talked about Ricky and Lewis and their stories, but there were four Indians that were involved in the slaughter of the elk herd. We've also got Cass and Gabriel, and we also get into their stories too, 10 years later. I just, I, I want to leave it there 
I don't want to go into any of the other plots because it goes, it spirals into wacky horror novel. Just, and it's great because not only are there those gross out moments, but it's also deeply intellectual, philosophical um, stuff here. I mean, I, I, I was really impressed with this. I was really impressed with this novel. I mean, it was one of the better non-Stephen King horror novels I've ever read. And, and so I just got to give it a big thumbs up for y'all folks. I think you'll love it. I think that it talks about a lot of subjects that are difficult to talk about. And it talks about them frankly and honestly, not just Native American and uh, their relationship with the land, the animals, white people, but also the relationship between men and women, uh, families, co-workers, everything. Everything comes into play here. Motorcycles, basketball. I mean, it's got it all. Basketball is a is a very he uses the he uses basketball as a metaphor for a lot of stuff in this book because a lot of the characters play basketball. A lot of the characters are very athletic. A lot of the characters, I mean, and so basketball and sports and motorcycle riding and hunting and basket. I mean, that's all used as metaphors, even down to the guys Lewis, the, the name of the guy Lewis A. Clark. Nicknamed Merriweather. I mean, they've all, each one of these Indian, four Indian boys has got a nickname. And it's just, I, I just, I haven't figured out all of the meaning. I haven't figured it all out, but it's there. I know it's there. And um, maybe it's not meant to be figured out. Maybe it's just in there to make you go, what? So I give the only good Indians a solid nine out of ten. The only thing I wish is it could have been longer for me. I mean, this is this story flies by. It's only 300 pages. The writing is sparse. Not, not It's descriptive enough, but I could have been more descriptive for my taste. But I, hey, I'm a garrulous guy. I just throw words into my stories like, like there's no end to them. But this guy really, this guy really dials it back. Very eloquent writing. Nine out of ten, folks.